Well, hello and welcome again to Bible Topics. I do pray and hope that this time will be profitable as I believe it has been up to this stage. It's hard to believe we've now had over a year of Bible Topics programs. I've thoroughly enjoyed and felt it a real privilege to be able to present this program both individually and with a number of esteemed guests. If you're one of those guests who have joined me before, uh, many, many thanks for making this program what it has been over this past year. Now, we have a very important question on our plate for this evening, and that question relates to how it is that we can be right with God how it is that we can find the Bible word for it that I think most of you will be familiar with is salvation. Now salvation of course implies uh, that we're being saved from something and I just want to remind you that what we are saved from is first of all our sin. The sin that we commit against God which brings a rift between us and God in our relationship. God is the creator of all. In that sense, He is the Father of all. And yet we have become alienated and estranged from God due to sin. We have lived um, exiled from right relationship with Him, and we need mediation to restore that which has been lost. The Scriptures tell us that we do have mediation. We have a mediator, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. He is the one who can reconcile us to God. He is the one who can save us and does save us from our sin. Not only are we saved from our sin, we are saved from sin's consequences. There's cause and there's effect. Sin is a toxin in our lives. Sin destroys, it poisons, it is something that needs to be completely uprooted and eradicated. Sin creeps into our relationships individually, it creeps into our relationships as pertains to other believers in Christ, it creeps into our relationships with friends, family, those around us, how we treat other individuals, whether we know them or not in a personal way. Sin is above all what destroys our relationship with God and because God is holy, because He is righteous and because He is just, we cannot continue in His presence. We cannot be right with Him and we cannot enjoy His heaven. We cannot enjoy the new heaven and new earth of righteousness which He promises to inaugurate after the destruction of this corrupted world if we have not been saved from our sin and its consequences. The consequences are of course destroyed relationships with each other, in some cases destroyed relationship with God, ultimately death the wages of sin is death, the Scriptures say, but the gift of God is everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the consequences of sin ultimately leads to death. We all will die unless the Lord Jesus returns before our physical death. So we have the wages of sin which is death, but there can be a sense in which there's a further consequence and that is if we don't have right relationship with God. The scriptures refer to this as the second death, the lake of fire, hell. This is the righteous judgment of God against sin and upon those who persist in ungodliness without reconciliation through Jesus Christ. So that's a reminder of what salvation is. We're saved from sin and we are saved from sin's consequences. Salvation comes through a process. There are three words that we need to consider when we consider that process of salvation. I believe we've talked about them before at varying points here on Bible Topics. But the words are justification, and that is the process through which we are made just as if we had never sinned. Uh, so through Jesus Christ, through repentance and faith in Him, I am justified, I am made right before God. I, though I have sinned, I am made just if I would never sinned. The second part is sanctification. Sanctification is the process through which 
I am made just, through which I am made holy, through which I am prepared for the new heavens and new earth of righteousness. It's a growing process, that growing process that each of us will experience in our faith. After we have been justified, from that point on, we begin this process of growth. I no longer speak the same way I used to speak. I no longer do the things that I used to do. I am no longer drawn to some of the sin activities that I was previously drawn to. I no longer engage carelessly in some of the categories of action that the scriptures speak of as the works of the flesh. The things like anger, slander, gossip, all of that sort of thing, um, as well as the other areas that perhaps have more tangible and can have more catastrophic consequences, things like sexual immorality, murder, etc. Further, after sanctification, there's glorification. When I stand in the new heavens and new earth, having been justified, having been sanctified, I am now going to be glorified. I'm going to reign with our Savior, Jesus Christ, in the new heavens and new earth. That's what we profess. When we say that we um, are saved, we are referring to something that has taken place in the past and that we've been justified, that something that is ongoing in the present, we are being sanctified, and something that will find its fullness in the future. We have uh, been preserved and have persevered to the end, and so we are glorified there in heaven. That is that process of salvation. Now, the question is important, one that we need to ask is, can I be saved outside of Jesus? Is there any possible way that I can be right with God without faith in Jesus Christ? This is a question that many people present, that many people ask. And I want us to unpack a couple of Bible passages and to um, deal with this claim, um, a particular claim that can be summed up in these words. Salvation is found in no one else. Salvation is found in no one else. Go to Acts, uh, and the Acts of the Apostles, uh, rather the Acts of the Lord really, through the Apostles, Acts chapter 4, we see a, a powerful message as Peter and John go before the council, that's the Sanhedrin. And as we, we see in verse 1, they were speaking to the people. As they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. They were greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. 
So they called them and charged them to not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Now, a little bit of the context of this. We have Peter and John going to the temple at the hour of prayer. And as they are going there in the ninth hour, which um, is about 3 p.m., this man who had been lame from birth, he had never known what it was to be whole in his body, is healed um, by the power of the Holy Spirit working through Peter and John. Peter directs his gaze at this lame man, as did John, and says, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. Verse 6 of chapter 3, But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. He leaped up, he stood up, he began to walk, he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And so many people see this and they rejoice and they recognize the power of God at work. And we see that this, um, this man, it says he, he clings to Peter and John and all the people, they're astounded. They run and they see what's going on and Peter then proclaims the gospel of Jesus, uh, facilitating an uproar on the part particularly of the Sadducees, uh, the priests, and the captain of the temple, most of whom at this juncture in um, history were Sadducees. Now, the Jewish council was made up primarily of two groupings, the Pharisees, and there were scribes who were often uh, Pharisees, but some were Essenes, a, a particular sect group, um, very Pharisaical though in their beliefs and practices, and the Sadducees, who was fairly evenly split. Uh, but at this juncture, it's believed that the primary rulers of the temple and those who were involved in the priesthood were of the Sadducees. What makes the Sadducees particularly unique is that they were individuals who, though Jews and though they subscribed allegedly to the Jewish scriptures, they denied most things spiritual. They denied the existence of angels and demons. They ignite that they denied um, eternal life. They denied resurrection, particularly uh, was a massive uh, denial that they had. And what one wonders what it was really that they did stand for, what they accepted, what they believed. So the saying goes, that's why they were sad, you see. Uh, but the, the, these individuals, you can kind of look at and see some parallels between them and some of the uh, liberal theologians that are around today who deny uh, the truth of God's Word, who deny the veracity and historical authenticity of its record, who deny spiritual warfare and the existence of angels and demons, who deny the resurrection not only of Jesus Christ but the resurrection of those who are dead in Christ unto everlasting life, who deny even that salvation is found in Jesus Christ alone, which is what we're dealing with. But this is inarguably the claim that is made in Peter and John's message to these priests and these rulers of the people. They say salvation is found in no one else. It's a substantial claim. Let's talk first about the reality of this claim. It, it's substantial. It's a pretty big claim. Uh, it's incredibly significant, and it goes beyond what most people might very well be happy to acknowledge concerning Jesus. You see, uh, there are quite a few people who are more than happy to acknowledge Jesus as some kind of good man. Uh, there's quite a lot that people believe about Jesus uh, that we can agree to. He was a good man. He was a prophet. He did teach us to love one another. He was the Messiah, 
even Muslims believe that he was the Messiah. They believe that he was the Messiah, that he came, he lived. Uh, they don't believe he died. They don't believe he was resurrected, but they do believe Jesus is returning again from wherever it is he is now. Uh, it, a, he was a good teacher. He was a rabbi. His message was one of good news for all people. I hear these things from non-Christians all the time. I highly doubt that there are any, there's anyone that you can find, I highly doubt that there's anyone you know who would deny that Jesus was a good man. Many would say he was a prophet. Many would agree, probably most would say he taught us to love one another. Many would say he is the Messiah. Many would say he was a good teacher or he had good things to say. Some would agree that he was a good rabbi. And most would agree that his message was one of good news for all peoples. Very few would dispute these truths about Jesus. But unfortunately, often these things are, are, are where it ends in regard to Jesus. And people then come up with a range of false ideas about Jesus. Uh, they say he was a good man, but what they really mean is he was just a man. They say he was a prophet, but he was only a prophet. He was nothing more. He was not prophet, priest, and the everlasting, eternal, forever king of um, the forever kingdom, the one true God made flesh. Others believe that the love that Jesus had for people with, through which he gave up his own life, the love which led him to even die for his enemies, is the sort of love that means, well, um, he taught and he himself practiced unconditional forgiveness. Now, I need to be very clear here. We should all have forgiving spirits and attitudes uh, toward uh, those even who wrong us. The scriptures uh, definitely do speak of uh, Christians' role and responsibility and the power of loving one's enemies. Jesus Christ himself is the example of this. There should be that forgiving spirit. But uh, that forgiving spirit and that willingness for reconciliation and, and restoration does not entail an attitude that um, just completely extinguishes and denies responsibility. Think about it. If someone has abused you and someone has uh, denigrated you and has uh, continuously um, acted against you, they knock on your door. Are you going to let them in your house? Well, hopefully not. That would not be a wise course of action. That would not be a good or just course of action. You may have a decent attitude toward that individual, and you should speak with them in a way of uh, clear Christian conviction, but that doesn't mean that you have a reconciled or fully restored relationship. In the same way, God does not unconditionally forgive everyone. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, is the message of, of Jesus. Jesus speaks to the rulers of the people, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, and He speaks some very hard words to them. The Gospels are filled with objective and absolute statements of how there is only salvation in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Himself speaks of coming judgment. So it's clear that God does not just accept anyone and everyone, regardless of their attitude towards Him. Some people think, well, okay, if God is good, well, then He won't care how I live my life. If God is good, if God is loving, if God is, um, is all of that, well, okay, um, it doesn't really matter what I do in regard to Him. He'll accept me anyway. While it's true that God does accept us as we are, He does not keep us as we are. His love receives us for who we are, but His love changes us forever and transforms us. And this is a transformation that when we come to Him in the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, it, we desire. We desire that change. We desire uh, to be more like Jesus Christ. So the claim salvation is found in no one else is rooted in this idea that Jesus is more than just a man, more than just a, a good guy, more than just a prophet, more than just some other mortal being. C.S. Lewis, who was an atheist philosopher and skeptic who eventually became a Christian and was a teacher and apologist, 
continuing to teach at Oxford, had this to say, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, that is Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. A very interesting statement from C.S. Lewis there, who eventually came to recognize the claims of Jesus for what they were. Salvation is found in no one else. It's a substantial, pretty big claim. But it's also substantive in that it's a verifiable claim. It's substantial in that it's a very big thing to say that out of the over 4,000 religions and belief systems that can be chronologued in the world, this one happens to be right. And often it's presented to me in a kind of sarcastic way. Oh, of course, of course, yours out of all of the thousands of belief systems, of course you believe yours is the right one. And I have no problem saying, absolutely, that's correct. How often can we look at a mathematical problem, okay? How many different variations of answers can there be to mathematical problems? Well, you, you can come up with any number. Uh, there's an infinite number of answers to a mathematical problem, and there's an infinite number of solutions that an individual can arrive at by a range of means and mistakes, but there's only one answer that is the correct answer. In the same way, when we approach the existence of God, there must be one who is truly God. There must be one who is objectively, absolutely, the creator of all. And it's our responsibility to find Him. He's not far from each one of us. We can find Him and we can know Him. I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe that. Salvation is found in no one else. This is a verifiable claim. This is what um, Peter and John bring home really in um, verses 10 through 12 here of Acts chapter 4. What we see, they say, Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Think about it for a minute. Of all of the world religions that you are aware of, and I dare say that um, you might, if given a piece of paper, be able to name maybe 15 uh, belief systems or um, re religious groupings. Out of all of those, can you think of any that claim exclusivity? Can you think of any that say, by this individual, you can be saved? Most belief systems that are out there, the ones that immediately come to mind, you can quite clearly show that salvation is essentially up to you. It's according to what you do. It's according to how you behave. It's according to you checking particular boxes. Even as a Christian, my actions and my beliefs do not interfere with many belief systems, with many religions, idea of salvation. As long as I do good things, as long as I do what's right, it doesn't really matter what I believe. Certainly in Hinduism, there's an acceptance of so many different belief systems to the degree that one friend once commented that upon addressing this topic with his mother, can we be saved? Can we be right with God? Can we escape sin and its consequences? Can we escape hell um, by any other means? She said, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe. Now, certainly, I cannot say that as a follower of Jesus Christ. 
because I hold to the apostolic teaching that is here that salvation is found in no one else outside of Jesus Christ. It is a substantive claim that is rooted in a historical character. Paul and John, uh, rather Peter and John, make it very, very clear here. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He, they're referring to this actual historical character who would be known. He said, whom you crucified. And you among the priests, you directly speaking personally, some of these individuals, I remind you, would have been the leaders who actually facilitated the death of Jesus Christ. Now, some people like to weaponize this passage. And increasingly in days where anti-Semitism has infected so much of our society, including many church groupings and gatherings, and people like to say, oh yeah, the, the Jews crucified Jesus, when actually, first of all, Jesus said, no one takes my life from me, I lay it down myself. Secondly, uh, there were Jews and Gentiles involved in Jesus' death. Thirdly, uh, the Jews as a whole and as a collective did not uh, as a whole and collective crucified Jesus, merely certain people of the Jews crucified Jesus. But of these individuals, Peter and John, they're saying you, they're not speaking in a generic sense, they're saying no, you actually, oh, we, we recall you, you who are the priests, you who are the Sadducees here, we recall you being there um, at his trial. We recall you presenting false witnesses. We recall you, and you will recall yourself, um, being those who brought false charges against Jesus leading to his crucifixion. But God raised Jesus from the dead. They state this as a verifiable, substantive, objective fact. One, that the priests and those gathered would have been familiar with in regards to the claim. Many would have doubtless even seen Jesus. There were at one stage over 500 people. So almost all of these individuals who find themselves in this place in Jerusalem at this time would have at the very least known someone who had seen the resurrected Jesus. Salvation is found in no one else. Now, we, we can whittle this down and we can uh, consider three historic religions. We can consider Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, which all claim roots in Abraham. The, that's essentially where their similarity lies. They all claim roots in Abraham. They all accept the value of the Old Testament law and to some degree, and Islam also will claim that the Gospels are important. The Injil, um, as they refer to the story of um, the good news of Jesus, although they would not practically adhere to it or um, accept it as whole, all acknowledge Jesus' existence as well. Now, in regard to uh, the, these three Abrahamic faiths, so to speak, these three religions that can, um, as monotheistic religions rooted in a particular historical framework that goes all of the way back to Abraham, uh, they have certain things to say about Jesus. Judaism, uh, by and large, and we're, we're talking more about rabbinical Talmudic Judaism. Of course, there are many Jews who are followers of Jesus. But um, by and large, Judaism says ideologically that Jesus was an imposter because he claimed equality with God. I've been listening periodically to a podcast on Jewish history, and it's interesting how it likes to avoid speaking directly of Jesus and how it likes to avoid uh, using even Jesus' name. It uh, refers to him uh, simply as J.C., and, and they um, will occasionally speak of Jesus by name, but generally will refer to um, Christians and those who were Jews who followed Jesus as part of kind of an interesting, weird sect and, and cult group. Um, uh, and they make a heavy differentiation between those Jews who uh, followed um, Jesus and the Jews who would say he was an imposter because he claimed equality with God. Certainly we see here in the New Testament there are many who really deny 
Jesus and they turn away from Jesus. Indeed, they pick up stones in one case to stone Jesus and ultimately he's crucified because they said he, being a man, makes himself equal with God. So it was very clear in people's minds who Jesus claimed to be. Christians, we believe that he is equal with God and is the Messiah. Islam believes that he is a good man and a prophet. So uh, that's what we believe in regard to, um, to Jesus. So there's the similarities that we've discussed, but we're very different when it comes to Jesus. The three cannot all be equally correct. Logically, it doesn't make sense. Rationally, we cannot say, as some very much would like us to, that we all worship the same God, we all are going to the same place, we all believe the same thing, because we quite simply and objectively don't. Jesus was who He claimed to be, or He was not. What did He claim to be? Judaism is quite clear on what He claimed to be, but on the whole, for uh, the majority of time has denied um, a, as a large conglomerate group the claims of Jesus to be Messiah and the claims of His followers. Christianity says He is equal with God and is Messiah. Islam says He's a good man and a prophet. Not fully equal with God, not fully able to, well, save us from our sin. They do believe He is the Messiah, but ultimately only a man. Now, on salvation, we see that Judaism um, says we need to fulfill the Old Testament law. There is even a process, some people may not be aware of that, there's a process um, of conversion to Judaism. And indeed, throughout the Old Testament, we do see there are people who become a part of the covenant community. You can see the Gibeonites uh, in the Old Testament. You can also read up, I'm sure, as you'll be familiar perhaps with Ruth, and she was a Moabitess. There are many others as well. You can consider even among David's mighty men. David's mighty men had uh, many people, there were many who served alongside David, who were, it seems, a part of the covenant community of God's people, who were not ethnically Hebrews. They were not ethnically Jewish, and yet they were part of the covenant community. They found themselves worshiping the one true God, Yahweh. Judaism says you need to fulfill the Old Testament law, and again, salvation is about what you do. Christianity says turn from sin and trust in Jesus. Salvation is about what He has done, what He did. In Islam, we're uh, told we need to keep the five pillars. This is uh, essentially Allah's law. Uh, once again, salvation is about what you do. So you see that there's a difference. In modern day Judaism and Islam, you have salvation being about what you do. And following Jesus, it's all about what He has done. It's all about Jesus. So the, the claim that we have here, uh, that salvation is found in no one else, is substantial. It's a pretty big claim. It's substantive. It's a verifiable claim. But can I say it's sufficient? It's an exclusive claim. It, it, it's a claim that is not open to any other belief joining alongside it. It's not open to being paired with or syncretized with uh, any other system. It is a, a, a nonsense, an oxymoron, completely inconsistent to say that you can faithfully follow Jesus and also belong to some other alternative belief system. You cannot be a Christian, a Muslim, and a Jew at the same time. Right? You, you, you can be um, Jewish and a follower of Jesus. You can be um, a Gentile and follower of Jesus. You can be of an Islamic background and a follower of Jesus. But you cannot follow Jesus and persist in acting like everyone and everything believes the same, because we simply don't. Salvation is found in no one else is the claim that these Jewish apostles, Peter and John, present um, to these leaders of the people. It's a very exclusive claim saying that um, to the priest that 
in effect, their mediation, their efforts, their intercession in the temple is not what saves. Only Jesus can now provide the mediation that we need with God. Now, this leads to a range of responses. And uh, a lot of times people, they ha have this attitude and this action. They see um, people talk about Jesus and Jesus being the only way to salvation. And it's been routinely butchered and caricatured by all sorts of television programs and movies, generally depicted with individuals uh, ringing bells and holding placards, calling people to uh, sin it no more, the judgment is at hand, the end is nigh, that sort of thing, uh, which, of course, the scriptures do speak of. The scriptures do call us to prepare for the end. And of course, there are individuals who perhaps could do a, 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 probably, we might would think, a superficially better job of presenting this message, uh, but who uh, at the end of the day are in many cases accurately and faithfully um, trying to do their best to call people to see who Jesus is and who He has called the world to be. The responses to this claim vary, and we see a, a good unpacking of the type of response to expect here in Acts chapter 4. In Acts 4 verse 2, we see initially uh, there's annoy, an annoyance. The, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees, it says, came upon them, having already been greatly annoyed. They were greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now, a reminder that the Sadducees denied resurrection from the dead. They not only denied resurrection from the dead um, of, of Jesus, they denied resurrection from the dead as a principle. They didn't believe in any resurrection. They didn't believe in a coming resurrection, a past resurrection. Any resurrection was completely out of line and out of the worldview for the Sadducees. So their primary annoyance is that they're teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus resurrection from the dead. That's their primary gripe. And we see this throughout the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, it's very evident from uh, Jewish history that you can read and study to this day. So first of all, they are annoyed. But their annoyance is one thing. Their annoyance doesn't stop with annoyance. Their annoyance leads to the assault, which verse 1 speaks of. As they were speaking to the people, it seems that at this point the annoyance starts because they are teaching the people Jesus and His resurrection. The priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. They set upon them. They essentially assaulted them. They come against them uh, because they have been annoyed by the teaching. Further from that, they arrest them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. So they're arrested there in Acts 4.3. Now, the next day, we see that they are given an opportunity to present their case. And we see the rulers, elders, and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, all who were of the high priestly family, which I remind you were primarily Sadducees at this juncture in time. When they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Primarily at this point, not just speaking of the resurrection and uh, the, the teaching of the resurrection, which is the reason they were annoyed, the reason they assaulted them, the reason they arrested them. They're actually speaking at this point and raising the healing of this man who was the catalyst through which they then began to teach in the temple. They've seen a healing of a man who was born lame. He is walking and leaping and praising God. The people are astonished. Uh, they're utterly astounded. Verse 11 of chapter 3 um, says, and here in, in verse uh, 13, uh, Peter and John having witnessed to Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who was crucified, raised from the dead, by him, this man is standing before you well. They declare that Jesus is the one prophesied who would be the cornerstone rejected by the builders, the leaders of the people. 
they say there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, uh, common men, they were astonished. Guys, you can declare this same truth. The amount of times I hear people say, well, my English isn't too good, or, oh, my, um, my speech and how I communicate isn't always good. These things, these things, first of all, can be improved, okay? But these guys here, Peter and John, they were uneducated. They were common. Their accents, their voices, their manner of speech was perceivably uneducated and common, but it did not matter because they had the power of the Holy Spirit communicating. Do not think that the ministry and the proclamation of God's Word is designated only for those who are educated or only for special, uncommon individuals. It is not. It is for those who are uneducated and it is for those who are common just as much as for anyone else. And this puts these highly educated scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, and priests, most of whom were Sadducees, into this state of astonishment. And they recognize, they recognize that these individuals have been with Jesus. They see the power of this one who they could inarguably, they had to inarguably recognize was a great rabbi. They had been with this rabbi. They had been with Jesus. So they are utterly astonished. And this leads to the acclamation, the acclaim of so many. Already 5,000 people have heard the gospel and they've believed. And the number of men we see in verse 4 there came to about 5,000. But in verse 21 we read that after further threatening Peter and John, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. 40 years of living lame and now he is healed and everyone is praising God. It would be a massive PR uh, faux pas for them to continue to punish Peter and John. Um, it would be a political suicide essentially. And as we see throughout the scriptures there was always this desire to appease the people and retain power. So they were just going to bide their time on the persecution element. Verse 31, we see that uh, after there's this uh, release, after um, Peter and John have been released to the people, they go to their friends, they report what the chief priests and the elders have said. And everyone, verse 24, it says, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our, serv our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed for truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of, of Israel. So Jew and Gentile are involved here. A reminder, okay, everyone is involved. We are all culpable. We are all responsible um, to a significant degree to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. This was God's plan. It wasn't in their power. It was in God's power according to His divine plan for the purpose of salvation. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Powerful, powerful prayer. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Salvation is found in no one else. Um, this is the message that, yes, produces anointing. It can produce assault. People don't like this exclusive message. It can lead to some people's arrest. And indeed, there are many countries on the face of the earth today where it is actually illegal to follow Jesus Christ, much less to proclaim that He is the only way that we can be right with God. It leads to astonishment when believers continue to proclaim this all the same and when they walk in His power and when that is accompanied by uh, divine signs that the Lord works in and through. 
But it leads to many people's acceptance of the truth. The acceptance which sees, as we said in verse 4, 5,000, about 5,000 people come to repentance and faith, leading to the acclaim of those who see God's power at work. Now, this is entirely consistent with the message of Jesus Himself. Uh, letting Jesus introduce and speak for Himself um, clarifies why the apostles taught and believed these things. They had it always. They were on many occasions, we can see throughout the Gospels, confused and perplexed to some degree about not just Jesus' identity, but the ramifications of Jesus' identity. They had a measure of understanding of who Jesus was, but didn't fully understand the practical outworking of that. And yet when we see Jesus communicate, not only with His disciples, the apostles, and um, others who, who were around, consistently declares to them who He is. I find no passage clearer than there in John 14, where after multiple occasions of using the divine name, translated, I am, Jesus declares to the apostles, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also, and you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you do know him and have seen him. And we see Jesus declares uh, this reality in the midst of um, our social conundrums and spiritual confusions and all of the issues that surround. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Those words in the original language are accompanied by and emphasized by two definite articles. So if we were to translate that over into English, it would read, I am the, the way, the, the truth, the, the life. We can make it all the clearer and say, I am the only way, the only truth, the only life. And if that's not clear enough, then the follow-on is, no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, our human condition is such that we like to equivocate and we like to qualify and we like to add disclaimers and we would like to be able to say, well, um, no one comes to the Father except through Jesus except for this person or unless this person has done this or what about those people? But that's not what Jesus says. That's not how Jesus opens it up. That's not what uh, Jesus declared or the apostles, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, some people might say, well, then what about those Old Testament saints who didn't know Jesus in the flesh? And I, I think the qualifier is that they didn't know Jesus in the flesh, but they were looking toward the Christ. They were looking toward the Messiah. They were waiting for the redemption of Israel. We see certainly Simeon there in Luke chapter 2 as he holds the baby Jesus in his arms. He recognizes this is the one promised even directly and personally to him as uh, to be the Messiah. He says uh, in verse 29 uh, to the Lord of Luke chapter 2, Lord, now you are setting Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you are prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. Joseph and Mary marvel at what is said about him, and, and Simeon proceeds to bless them and speak, and speaks prophetically even of, of the crucifixion uh, there to Mary. But What's quite evident is that this man Simeon has been looking forward to the one who will bring salvation, the one who is Messiah. There's really only 
uh, the difference uh, b between us and the Old Testament saints. They were looking forward to the Christ. We are looking backward. In the Old Testament, as God is revealing Himself to His people, He is establishing and making covenant. He is reminding of and fulfilling those covenants that He has made. He promises that there will be from the line of David a forever king who will establish a forever kingdom. He is going to be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He's going to overthrow the enemies of the Lord. And this is where many people believed this. Uh, pro the primary enemies were political or national. There were political and national enemies that were to be overthrown, certainly, and God has done in time and space very much that. But the primary enemy that we see is sin and death. And there's ongoing work towards the return of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, uh, in relation to those enemies being overthrown. 1 Corinthians 15 says that the final enemy to be destroyed is death. And yeah, it will be destroyed. In the very last book of the Bible, Revelation, we see that that ancient serpent, Satan, the dragon, as he's spoken of as well in Revelation, is going to be bound and he's going to be cast into a pit and, and chains for a thousand years. And there's going to be a millennial reign of Jesus with his saints resurrected, uh, followed by a release, a brief temporary release of that serpent, of Satan. There's going to be full and final destruction of Satan, the demons, and all indeed who are not in Jesus Christ. It's a strange thing when we take the Bible and we take Jesus and we say, well, we believe in Jesus and we believe He was this, He, he was a good man, or He was a prophet. He, we, we say He t taught what was good and we say He taught the truth, but then we don't actually believe what He taught. It's actually a tragic reality when we take Jesus' words, uh, at least in a generic sense, and we say, oh yeah, Jesus, He taught a lot of good things and His message was of love and His message was of good news. And indeed it was. It was very, very good news. And indeed it was of love. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. But it says that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Too many people like to stop it there, but uh, let me remind you that Jesus doesn't stop it there. He says, whoever believes in Him should have eternal life. What about those who do not believe in Him? What about those who do not go to God uh, for right relationship, for that salvation that we were talking about at the beginning of the program through Jesus? Jesus speaks very clearly to this very religious man who is self-satisfied and self-assured in his own uh, sense of goodness, Nicodemus. It's there in John chapter 3. He says, uh, God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. That's wonderful. And we, we, again, we like to stop there sometimes. But he says, whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For who, everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Friends, where are you right now? What are you doing? Where, where, where are you in your heart and in your mind? Where do you fall into this category of faith? Now, some of you might think, well, um, in relation to how you get to God, how you can be saved, how you're right with God. Someone was to say, well, what makes you think you'll be accepted by God? Oh, I was born Christian. 
And yet Jesus tells this man, uh, Nicodemus, who's uh, more religious than any of us um, probably have ever thought of being, he kept the law, he was a Pharisee, he knew God's Word by heart and was able to, he, he would have been among the many who had memorized the entirety of the Torah, maybe even large chunks of the Ketuvim and the Navim, the writings and the prophets. Uh, he tells Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. I was born Christian, frankly, doesn't cut it. My family is Christian, doesn't either. I'm from a Christian country, there's really no such thing. Uh, I'm a good person, I'm spiritual, I go to church, I believe in God, I'm religious. I feel like God will accept me as I am whether I have anything to do with Him or not. These are reasons that people give as to why they think God will accept them but they are completely contrary to the message of Jesus Christ Himself. There's no name given under heaven by which we can be saved. It's a substantial, substantive, and sufficient claim. And it's one that I present to you. Do you have this salvation that's in Jesus Christ? Does this message offend you? Is it something that kind of gets your back up a little bit? Are, are you? Are you feeling kind of like those people who were annoyed by the message and they were uh, there assaulting Peter and John and they arrested them? Are you, are you astonished that anyone here in 2024 could actually believe this message? Well, I believe it. It's the message that has endured throughout time. It's a message that was declared by the apostles and most importantly by Jesus. I pray that you believe it and I pray you know this salvation that is found in Christ alone and that it will continue to lead you throughout all your days until you stand before Him in glory. God bless you. I'll see you again next time on Bible Topics.